Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to House of the Scorpion, Chapter 17, The Idiot Pens. This is, uh, I mean, the support you guys are showing is amazing, but I've got a lot more to do today, so let's just jump right into it. The Mendozas left immediately after Maria, pale and miserable, emerged from El Patron's apartment. El Patron decamped not long after with his bodyguards. Matt was alone again. He couldn't talk to Maria or Tamlin, but knowing they'd still like to made all the difference. He studied things he thought would, they would approve of. He read survival manuals for Tamlin and a long, confusing book about St. Francis to please Maria. St. Francis loved everyone, from murderous bandits to beggars covered with running sores. There was a picture of one of these in the book. He called the Cicada to his finger and said, Welcome, Sister Cicada. Praise God with your joyful music. St. Francis spoke to everything, Brother Sun and Sister Moon, Brother Falcon and Sister Lark. It gave Matt the warm feeling that mm, the world was one loving family, very unlike the Alacrans. But would St. Francis have called him, said Brother Clone? Matt's warm feelings evaporated. He wasn't part of the natural order. He was an abomination. No matter where he was, Matt couldn't rid himself of the sensation he was being watched. It was bad enough to know the security guard had spied on him, but far worse was to think of Felicia. She was as awful as Tom, only no one suspected it because she seemed so meek. She reminded Matt of one of those jellyfish he'd seen on TV. They floated around the ocean like fluffy pillows, trailing enough venom to paralyze a swimmer. Why hadn't he realized Felicia hated him? Well, to be honest, because most people hated him. It was no big thing. But her malevolence was in a class by itself. Once a week, Matt went to the stables and asked for a safe horse before going out. Though he tried to have a conversation with Rosa, he didn't like her. He wasn't sure why he'd wanted to wake her up, only that it seemed horrible to see her so changed. If there was anything left of Rosa, it was locked in an iron box. He imagined her banging on the walls with her fists, but no one came to open the door. He'd read that coma victims hear everything people say and need voices to keep their brains alive. And so Matt talked to her about everything he'd seen and done all week. But all Rosa was uh, ever replied was, do you wish another horse master? After an hour or so of this, Matt rode off to the oasis. Hello, Brother Sun, he called. Would you mind cooling down a bit? Brother Sun ignored him. Good morning, Sister Poppies. Matt called to the sea of blinding white flowers. Hello, Brother and Sister Egypts. He greeted a row of brown-clad workers bending over the fields. One of the most amazing things about St. Francis and his followers is that they gave away all their possessions. St. Francis couldn't wait to strip off his shirt and sandals whenever he saw a poor, poor, poor person without them. Brother Juniper, one of St. Francis' friends, even went home naked a lot of the time. Matt thought El Patron would have a heart attack if anyone told him to give away his belongings. Once Matt passed through the hole in the rock, it was as though he'd arrived in another world. The hawk circled lazily in a bright blue sky. The jackrabbits crouched in the shade of the creosotes. Fish nibbled bread from Matt's fingers, and coyotes darted forward to gobble down chunks of his sandwiches. None of them cared whether he was a human or a clone. Matt laid out a sleeping bag under the grape arbor and used a rolled-up blanket for a pillow. He placed a thermos of orange juice within his reach and selected a book. This was living. The air smelled faintly of creosote and yellow sweetness of locust flowers. A large black, black wasp with scarlet wings ran over the sand, searching for the spiders that were its prey. Hello, Brother Wasp, Matt said lazily. The insect dug furiously in the sand and found nothing and scurried on. Matt opened A History of Opium, one of the books Tamlin had left him, left him in the chest. He expected it to be a manual about farming, but it was something quite different and exciting. Opium, Matt read, was the whole country. It was a long, thin strip of sand of land lying between the United States and Aztlan. One hundred years ago, there had been trouble between the United States and Aztlan, which was called Mexico in those days. Matt vaguely remembered Celia saying something about it. Many thousands of Mexicans had floated across the border in search of work. A drug dealer named Mateo Alacran. Matt sat straight up. That was El Patron's name. One hundred years ago, he would have been a strong and active man. This person, the book went on to say, was one of the richest and most powerful men in the world, even though his business was illegal. Drugs illegal, thought Matt. What a strange idea. 
Mateo Alacran formed an alliance with the other dealers and approached the leaders of the United States and Mexico. You have two problems, he said. First, you cannot control your borders, and second, you cannot control us. He advised them to combine the problems. If both countries set aside land along their common border, the dealers would establish farms and stop the flow of illegals. In return, the dealers would promise not to sell drugs to the citizens of the United States and Mexico. They would peddle their wares in Europe, Asia, and Africa instead. It was a pact made in hell, said the book. Matt put it down. He couldn't see anything wrong with the plan. It seemed to have done everything, pro everything it promised. He looked at the title page. The author was Esperanza Mendoza. The Anti-Slavery Society, the Anti -Slavery Society of California was the publisher. Now that he looked more closely, he saw the book was on printed cheap yellow paper. It didn't look like something you could take seriously. Matt read on. At first, the book explained, opium was simply no man's land. But through the years it had prospered. Different areas were ruled by different families, much like the kingdoms of medieval Europe. A council of farmers was established, which dealt with international problems and kept peace between the various farms. Most families controlled small areas, but two were large enough to dictate the policy. The McGregors ruled the land near San Diego, and the Alacrans had a vast empire stretching from central California all across Arizona into New Mexico. Gradually, opium changed from a no-man's land to a real country, and its supreme leader, dictator, dictator and fuhrer, was Matteo Alacran. Matt stopped reading so he could savor the words. His heart swelled with pride. He didn't know what a fuhrer was, but it was obviously something very good. A more evil, vicious, and self-serving man could hardly be imagined, wrote Esper Esperanza on the next line. Matt threw the book away as hard as he could. It landed in the water with its pages open. How dare she insult El Patron? He was a genius. How many people could build a country out of nothing, especially someone as poor as El Patron had been? Esperanza was simply jealous. But Matt sprang up to rescue the book before it was entirely ruined. Tamlin had given it to him, and that made it valuable. He dried it out carefully and packed it away in the metal chest. On the way back, Matt stopped at the water purification plant and talked to the foreman. Since Tamlin's departure, Matt had thought long and hard about the excellent education he'd been given. It didn't make sense for him to spend the rest of his life as an exotic pet. El Patron didn't waste money like that. No, Matt reali no, Matt realized. The old man meant to him meant for him to have a higher destiny. He could never reach the status of Benito or Stephen, not being human. But he could but he could help them. And so Matt had begun to study the enterprise of running an opium empire worked. He saw how opium was planted, processed, and ma marketed. He watched how the idgits were moved from field to field, how often they were watered, and how many food pellets they were allowed. When I'm in charge, Matt quickly adjusted his thoughts. When I'm helping the person in charge, I'll free the idgits. Surely opium could be grown by normal people. They might not be as efficient, but anything was better than a mindless army of slaves. Now, Matt... Now that Matt had observed Rosa, he understood that. He asked the plant foreman about the underground river that flowed from the Gulf of California hundreds of miles away. It was used to supply the water to the Alacran estate, but it smelled, before it was purified, terrifyingly bad. The, for the plant f foreman refused to meet Matt's eyes. Like most humans, he didn't like talking to clones, but he also didn't want to anger El Patron. Why does the water smell like that? Matt said. Dead fish. Chemicals. The foreman replied, not looking up. But you take those out. Yes. Where do you put them? Wastelands, the man said, pointing north. He kept his answer as brief as possible. Matt shaded his eyes as he looked to the north. A heat haze shivered o shimmered over the desert, and he saw a series of ridges that might, up might be buildings. There? he asked doubtfully. Yes, the foreman replied. Matt turned the horse and started heading northward to get a clearer view. The smell was so vile, he feared he might have an asthma attack. He felt for his inhaler. They were buildings. They stretched in long rows with doors and dark little windows every so often. The roofs were so low, no, Matt wondered whether a person could stand up inside. The windows were covered with iron bars. Could this be where the agents lived? The idea was appalling. The closer Matt got, the stronger the stench became. 
It was a compound of rotten fish, excrement, and vomit with a swift, sweet chemical odor that was worse than the other smells put together. Matt grasped his inhaler. He knew he should leave at once, but the buildings were too intriguing. He could see skeletons of fish and seashells embedded into the dirt around them. It seemed the whole place was built on the waste from the Gulf of California. <coughs> Matt circled around the end, end of one of the buildings and rode down into a depression that must have been used for weight, waste. The evil smell made Matt's eyes water and he could barely focus on the dense yellow sludge at the bottom. The horse stumbled, its legs collapsed beneath it, and Matt had to throw his arms around its neck to keep from being catapulted into the sludge. Get up, get up, he ordered, but the horse was incapable of obeying. It sat on the ground with its, folded up, with its legs folded up underneath it. Matt felt himself getting dizzy. He threw himself on the horse and sucked de desperately at his inhaler. His lungs filled with liquid. A terror of drowning swept over him and he tried to crawl away from the trough. His fingers dug deep, dug into the rotting fish slime soil. A pair of hands yanked him up. He was dragged a short way away and thrown into the back of a vehicle. Matt felt the motor start. The vehicle was moved away in a plume of dust that made him cough. He tried to get up and was instantly slammed down by a boot on his chest. Shocked, Matt stared up at the coldest pair of eyes he had ever seen. At first, he thought he was looking at Tamlin, but this person was younger and leaner. He had the same wavy brown hair and blue eyes, the same physical alertness, but none of the good humor Matt was used to seeing on the, body, on the bodyguard's face. Where'd you get a horse? The man demanded. The man demanded. Where'd you get the brains to make a run for it? He's not an agent, Hugh, said another voice. Matt looked up to see another man, similar to the first one. Then you're an illegal, snarled Hugh. I reckon we'll run you to the hospital and let him put a clamp on your brain. You do that, Matt said with his heart beating very fast. He was afraid, but Tamlin had taught him it was foolhardy to show weakness. Act like you're in control, the bodyguard had said. And nine times out of ten you'll get away with it. Most people are cowards underneath. Matt realized these men belonged to the farm patrol, and thus, judging by Steely's stories, were very dangerous. You do that, Matt repeated, and I'll tell the doctor how you treated El Patron's clone. Say what, said Hugh, lifting his boot off Matt's chest. I'm El Patron's clone. I was visiting the water purification plant and got lost. Better yet, you can take me to the big house and I'll send a message to him. Matt was very far from feeling confident, but he observed El Patron give orders many times. He knew exactly how to reproduce the cold, deadly voice that got results. Crikey, even, s crikey, even sounds like the old vampire, said the second man. Shut your cake hole, snorted Hugh. Look, we weren't expecting you out there, Master, uh, Master, what do we call you? Matteo Alecran, Matt said. He was gratified to see the men flinch. Well, Master Alecran, we weren't expecting you, and you were by the Egypt pen, so it was a natural mistake. Did it occur to you to ask what I was doing out there? Matt said, narrowing his eyes as El Patron did when he wanted to be particularly menacing. I know we should have, sir. We really very, very sorry. We're taking you straight to the big house, and we're most humbly begging your pardon, aren't we, Ralph? Oh, yes, indeed, said the second man. What about my horse? We'll fix that up. Ralph banged on the cab of the truck. A window opened. He shouted instructions inside. We'll radio for a patrol to collect the nag. It was in a bad way from the dead air, sir. It might not survive. Dead air, said Matt, startled enough to drop out of his El Patron act. It sometimes happens around that tro, said Raff. The air doesn't move and the carbon dioxide builds up. It's like being in a mine. I lost a brother like that, remarked Hugh. You can't tell until it's too late, said Ralph. The nearby pens are usually okay, but on steel nights they make the Egypt sleep in the fields. Matt was amazed. Why don't you clean up the tro trough? Ralph seemed honestly puzzled at the idea. It's how we've always done things, Master Alacran. The Egypts don't care. Well, that's true, thought Matt. Even if the Egypts knew about the danger, they could flee unless they were or ordered to do so. Now that Matt appeared to accept the men's apology, they became almost friendly. They didn't act like most people did when they told when told Matt was a clone. They were weary but not hostile. 
In fact, they behaved a lot like Tam Lin. Are you Scottish? said Matt asked. Oh no, said Hugh. Ralph here is from England, and I'm from Wales. Wee Willie is in the cab is Scottish, though. We all like to play soccer and thump heads. Matt remembered something. El Patron had said long ago about Tamlin and Daft Donald. I picked this lot up in Scotland, breaking heads outside a soccer field. Always choose your bodyguards from another country. They find it harder to make alliances and betray you. Soccer sounds a lot like war, Matt said. Both Ralph and Hugh laughed. It is, lad. It is, said Hugh. The fine thing about soccer, said Ralph, with a distant look in his eyes, is that you enjoy both the game and the trimmings. Trimmings, Matt said. Ah, yes, that which surrounds the game. The build-up, the crush of fans, the trains. The parties, said Hugh with a dreamy look on his face. The parties, agreed Ralph. You crowd into a pub with your mates and drink until the owner throws you out. If he can throw you out, Hugh amended. And then either before or after you run into the fans on the other side, and so of course you have to set them straight. That's when the head-thumping occurs, Matt guessed. Yes, nothing finer, especially if you win, said Ralph. The truck followed a zigzag course through the poppy fields. Matt saw the Egypts he'd observed that morning. They were still bending over the ripe seed pods, but felt no impulse to call them brothers. They weren't brothers, and never would be, until they lost the clamp on, clamps on their brains. If, if you liked it so much, why did you come here? Matt had asked Ralph and Hugh. The men lost their dreamy expressions. Their eyes became cold and distant. Sometimes... Hugh began and then fell silent. Sometimes the head thumping goes too far, Ralph finished for him. It's okay to kill people in a war, then you're a hero. But in soccer, which is every bit as glorious, you're supposed to shake hands with the enemy afterward. Kiss their ruddy backside, more like, said Hugh in disgust. And we didn't like that, see? Matt thought he understood, Hugh. Understood. Hugh, Ralph, and Wee Willie in the cab were murderers. They were identical, ideal candidates for the farm patrol. They would have been loyal to El Patron, who would, who would dump them into the arms of whatever police force were looking for them. The lush gardens and red tile roofs of the big house were visible now. Nothing could have been further from the long, low dwellings where the Aegis lived. That is, when they weren't sleeping in the fields to keep from being gassed. Did Tam Lin kill anyone? Matt asked. He didn't much want to hear. He didn't much want to ask, but it might be the only opportunity to find out. Hugh and Ralph exchanged looks. He's in a class by himself, said Ralph. He's a bloody terrorist. Can't think why El Patron trusts him so much, said Hugh. They're like father and son. Put a cork in it. Can't you see who we're talking to, Hugh said. The house was near, and Matt was afraid they'd let him out before he knew wanted to know. What did Tamlin do, he urged. Only set a bomb outside the Prime Minister's house in London, replied Hugh. He was a Scottish nationalist, see. Wanted to... Bring back Bonnie Prince Charlie or some other fat slug. He was moved. <laughs> he was motivated by beer like the rest of us. Eh, nah, he's a cut above. Ralph said with his fancy ethics and social conscience. It's a shame a, s a school bus pulled up at the wrong moment," said Hugh. "The blast killed twenty kitties." That's what social conscience gets you," Ralph said as Matt as he helped Matt climb down. The truck drove off at once. The men seemed eager to get away, or perhaps were forbidden to show themselves around the civilized halls of El Patron's mansion. <laughs> End of chapter 17. Holy shit, this story's getting good. You can probably all see why I love this book so much, but... Until next time, I will talk to you all next video. Oh, and remember... Patreon link in the description. Check it out.